Live from the nation's capital, good morning, good morning. The countdown to the open, with equity futures negative a half of 1% and a complete lack of clarity here in Washington, D.C. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from Washington, we begin with the big issue. Too close to call. We know how much is at stake in this election. We're going to see what happens across the country. I'm not really sure really what to say right now. My goodness. I have fought the good fight. It is clear that we are going to take the House back. I never expected that we were going to turn these red counties blue. Congratulations to the next generation of Republicans. We will be in the majority and Nancy Pelosi will be in the minority. We are not sure if this journey is over tonight. We need to be patient and wait for every vote to be counted. Whether it's later tonight or tomorrow or four weeks from now. Freedom is here to stay. Two more years. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Team coverage begins right now with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie here in D.C., Katie Lyons in Philadelphia, Ed Ludlow joins us from Phoenix. Got to start with you, AMH, not the conversation many people expected to be having this time this morning. It's certainly not. We heard that from Lindsey Graham. He said it's not a Republican wave. That's for darn sure. Those were his words. So it does look like the Republicans, John, will take the House, but the margin is less than this wave and tsunami they were predicting. This morning, what we're really waiting on are these key Senate races. George which an election official tweeted that it's safe to say that's going to go to a runoff. We still have to wait for that confirmation, but that's what it looks like. So TBD, December 6th for the Georgia Senate, Nevada, Arizona, and Wisconsin. Those are the key races that are going to decide how the Senate shakes out. Let's pick out one. Arizona, Ed Ludlow, just how tight are things right now? Yeah, we did not get a red wave, but the Senate race here in Arizona is incredibly tight and there's still an opportunity for the Republicans to shift the balance in the Senate as well as an incredibly tight gubernatorial race where Carrie Lake is closing the gap on Katie Hobbs, the Democrat. Um, top of mind here in the state of Arizona, John, inflation. In the first nine months of this year, the pace of inflation here in Arizona higher than anywhere else pretty much in the country. And it's interesting. I'm, I'm zeroed in on voter behavior because there's evidence of ticket splitting, right? The economy is firmly in focus and Democrats and independents judging Joe Biden on it. It was interesting to see Mark Kelly, the Democratic uh, incumbent uh, in the Senate, distance himself from Biden on certain issues, including on the border. We had some issues with the electronic tabulators here in Maricopa County, which accounts for 60 percent of the electorate. Ultimately, safeguards were in place where officials tell me every single ballot will be counted with minimal delay. We expect a re final result probably Friday, but these are tight races. And remember, behind me at the Maricopa County Tabulation Elections Office, this was ground zero for Trump and conservative factions of the GOP's efforts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. The candidates on the ticket for the GOP here in Arizona have very much focused in on that issue. Kelly Lines, you're in a place where we do have a result. We do have a result, John, and it's a victory for the Democrat. John Fetterman clinching a victory over the Republican candidate, Dr. Mehmet Oz, and as a result, flipping Senate seat here in Pennsylvania, taking the seat, of course, from retiring Republican Senator Pat Toomey. So this is a massive, massive victory for the Democrats. I will say that, of course, both Republicans for the Senate and governor's race, those candidates were backed by President Trump. So this is an indication that his sway uh, and influence on voters was not enough. And neither Dr. Oz no, nor Doug, Doug Mastriani, who, of course, was the Republican gubernatorial candidate, have 
conceded their race. So we will see in the coming days if there is acceptance or potentially denial of the results. Any questions on the integrity of the vote and any potential litigation that could come in the coming days. But again, this race has been called for the Democrat John Fetterman. As for what the policy implications of that could be for the economy, and financial markets. Fetterman has supported cutting taxes for working people. He wants to raise the federal minimum wage, cut health care costs. He has voiced support for Medicare for all and also supports legalizing marijuana in addition to wanting to ban Congress from trading stocks. So a lot of policy promises that he made on the campaign trail, John, of course, his ability to do so will depend on getting enough Democratic colleagues in the Senate, which is still a giant question mark. And a lot of this may be hard to accomplish if the House does indeed flip red. MH, the race that Candy Lyons just went through was considered by many to be almost a proxy war between the former president and the current president. And the question we're all asking this morning is how these results set up potentially who runs for 2024. Well, this morning is definitely a loss for the former president. Yeah, he had some wins in places like Ohio and J.D. Vance and uh, some others. But there's big losses when you look at Mehmet Oz losing in Pennsylvania, someone he put a lot of time behind. And then, of course, the biggest standout and really the winner of the night is Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. John, you played a little bit of that speech. And at the end, what the crowd was cheering was two more years. He has a governorship for four years. What they're saying is, we are behind you and we want you to win. And what's so interesting about Florida, and this is something that the Democrats are going to have to deal with in 2024, because this is really no longer purple. This is red to the fact that DeSantis won Miami-Dade. We haven't seen that in 20 years. These are Democratic strongholds that DeSantis just absolutely crushed. So Kevin McCarthy was in those clips that we played. And he was talking about that House majority. And that House majority isn't there yet, AMH. When do you expect to actually get some results here? Well, we have to wait throughout the day, um, potentially even in places like Nevada. It could be days. For the Senate, for Georgia, it is going to be likely December. Um, I, I can't give a time because we just don't know. There's still a lot of mail-in ballots coming. There's ballots from rural areas that are coming. And it would just be too soon to know. But one thing... And Lindsey Graham said this, it was not a Republican wave. So that also means that even though McCarthy is poised to be the speaker, he's going to have to moderate maybe. It's not going to be the Marjorie Taylor Greens that maybe have enough pressure to put on him. He's going to have to lead for really the moderates as well as some of those fringe members of his party. There's a lot of rethinking taking place this morning. AMH, you're going to be with us through the hour. Looking forward to your coverage. A special thanks to Katie Lyons in Philadelphia. Ed Ludlow in Phoenix is going to be busy potentially for the next 24 hours. Joining us now is Morgan Stanley's Michael Zizas. Michael, not the conversation maybe you and I thought we'd be having 24 hours ago. Looking forward 24 hours. The consequences, Michael, from what you've seen so far. Yeah, well, listen, I think it's interesting that Democrats outperformed the expectations that were set up by the prediction markets and the polling based models. But I think we're pretty close to actually knowing what we need to know from a markets perspective, which is to say that even if uh, the Republicans get the House by a slim majority, that sets up a divided government outcome. That means that Senate control less important to markets because the divided government outcome is sufficient to tell you that fiscal policy, you know, fiscal expansion is probably off the table for next year. You're not going to have a posture where Congress is working against the Fed's fight uh, on inflation. And so all of that is a pretty positive outlook for bond markets. I don't know if there's more of a read through than that. And you'll have that read through once you know that the Republicans have control of the House. Michael, I speak to a lot of people in fixed income, a lot of economists looking at America, and they say there's a difference between fiscal policy at the federal level and what we could see happen at the state level. Can you run me through that? Yeah, well, so at the state level, there's still plenty of money to be spent in terms of leftover money from COVID aid and the money coming through from the infrastructure package. So it's entirely possible that you're going to see state government spending increase over the next few years with that ramp up of the money that was already allocated from infrastructure investment. But again, that's not net any different than you would have expected based on the election outcomes uh, last night. Anything to complicate the Federal Reserve's job in 2023 from what you've seen so far? 
Yeah, I don't think so, right? I think the scenario that would have complicated the Fed's job was if Democrats kept control of both chambers, but also expanded those majorities substantially, particularly in the Senate. If that had happened, it would have negated the idea that inflation was a big political problem for them, and it would have given them degrees of freedom legislatively to work around some of their members that were holding the line on fiscal policy. That would have put things like expanded child tax credit, more clean energy subsidies on the table uh, for the markets to consider. And then, of course, you'd have to consider the idea that the Fed would have to lean against that with a higher peak rate. That doesn't seem to be, even though Democrats are outperforming, that doesn't seem to be a scenario that we're trending towards. Michael, overwhelmingly, in the conversations I've had, and I'm sure the conversations you've had, it's seen on Wall Street that gridlock is what we need right now. I wonder, Michael, whether gridlock is what we need 12 months from now. Do you see it as a little bit more of a complicated matter than maybe some people are giving it credit for? Yeah, I think the nuance is incredibly important, right? So if you're a bond market investor and you want to see that the Fed is successful in fighting inflation and therefore that the projection of the peak Fed funds rate isn't going to go up anymore, you like a gridlocked Congress because they're not going to intentionally or unintentionally push more fiscal stimulus into the economy. Um, Beyond that, though, uh, a, a gridlock Congress situationally can pose a problem, right? So if we have a debt ceiling crisis in the midst of weak market conditions and uh, an economic downturn that is potentially worse than expectations in 2023, that's a situational risk that could be meaningful. I think that's a bit hypothetical at the moment, so it's not going to impact markets right now, but it's something we have to keep an eye on. Michael Zizas, as always, Michael, just wonderful from Morgan Stanley, breaking down the results Thanks, of this election so far and the potential consequences as well. Thank you, sir. Equity futures down a half of 1% on the S&P. Let's get you some of the reaction from investors with Nuveen's Tony Rodriguez and Zach Griffiths of Credit Sites. And Tony, first to you. Are you ready to move on from this and just focus on CPI tomorrow morning? Or is it still too early to make that call? Well, good morning, Jonathan. Good to be with you, and I hope you're enjoying my uh, hometown of D.C. for these couple of days. Uh, I do think that we're ready to move on. I mean, the election certainly has, you know, meaningful implications, but it is a supporting actor to the Fed and to inflation. So the CPI that we're going to see tomorrow and, importantly, the next month that we will see prior to the December Fed meeting, those are both going to have, I think, outsized importance in what the Fed does at that December meeting. We're expecting 50 basis points at that meeting, so a little bit of a step down as opposed to another 75 or a fifth consecutive 75. So those two numbers, I think, have shown the potential to surprise negatively, as have all of the previous inflation data that we've seen. But when we're talking about the election, I think we're going to end up in a situation of essentially gridlock very difficult to see a UK-like scenario of debt-financed um, spending happening in our country, uh, given the setup in Congress as we look at the next two years. So the lead actor is going to continue to be the Fed. Zach, are you ready to move on as well? I think so. And you really don't have the red wave that some were expecting. And to us, when thinking about the near-term economic implications, there really is an appetite for fiscal spending in this high inflationary environment, even in the unlikely outcome that the Democrats were able to hold on to both chambers of Congress, which seems like it's very unlikely at this point, even though the Senate is up for grabs. So I think it does come down to CPI tomorrow and Tony's point that we do get an additional CPI print before the December FOMC meeting is huge. We're expecting to see a little bit of a downshift, and we agree with the call for 50 basis points in December. And we think those will be very important as the Fed considers the lags of its monetary policy changes to the economy and the cumulative tightening that it's done so far. Zach, I understand that right now this is the optimal policy mix for investors, that right now they want a Federal Reserve that can control inflation, and right now they want the certainty of Washington, D.C. not doing any more spending so the Fed can get its job done and everyone can move on. Zach, do you really believe that in 12 months that's going to be the optimal policy mix as well? A Fed that's trying to bring down inflation, an economy that might be rolling over, and a Washington, D.C. Congress with its hands tied behind its back? It's a difficult policy mix from that perspective, and I think it's really going to come down to just how much does the Fed tighten. I think the market's moved a little bit too much with respect to where it's pricing the terminal rate, and I think we're getting close to policy mistake territory if we get up towards five and a quarter, five and a half percent, which is a little bit above 
where the market is today, but not much. And I think there's been a little bit too much focus on Chairman Powell's press conference after the September or the November FOMC meeting and less focus on the changes to the policy statement that we think are going to be more crucial as long as we do get some progress on the inflation front. I think you've seen some disinflation on the good side. You saw that in the ISM manufacturing prices paid index for October falling into contractionary territory. So we're focused on that and think the Fed will be too. You're still seeing a lot of pressure on the shelter side, but we think they need to focus on the lags that their policy is going to have, some of the disinflation on the shelter side that's in the pipeline from higher mortgage rates and a softening housing market. And Tony, final word on this one. So Jonathan, I think you've hit the nail on the head that right now the policy mix is okay, but as we move through into the second half of next year, just like the Fed was constrained when we were at the zero lower bound to respond to any weakness, the, the, the U.S. government is constrained now to respond with any fiscal stimulus in the face of what we do think will be economic weakness. We're expecting a slowdown, probably a mild recession, and the ability for both the Fed because of inflation and the federal government because of their debt levels to address that we think will be challenging. And that's why we think we'll see some weakness in financial markets as we move into the first half of next year. We're going to have that conversation next. Tony and Zach are going to stick with us. I've said it all morning. I do not envy anyone that has to press send in the next couple of weeks on their 2023 outlook. Coming up, investors trying to leave the midterms behind and look ahead to CPI. Inflation is clearly far above our long run goal, communicating that that is our goal and that that is, you know, our North Star that we are heading to uh, and how we plan to, you know, do that and how we see the economy evolving is, is extremely important. Shifting from midterms to inflation in America, that conversation up next. more important, the election or CPI. I'd rather know CPI. I'd actually like CPI for the next three months, if you can give us. The more important thing is really going to be CPI. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely, I do. CPI is the number one thing the Fed is focused on. The Fed is really laser focused on the inflation readings. It's going to tell us whether that December meeting is 75 or 50. The CPI number has the potential to be a much more dramatic market, market move. The inflation statistics are going to be more important than the election. Inflation still in the spotlight as election results continue rolling in. U.S. CPI due in less than 24 hours from now. Economists looking for a little relief in core inflation in America. Mike McKee joins us now from New York. Morning, Mike. <laughs> Morning, John. Well, you know, it's not entirely true that uh, the election is more important than CPI or CPI is more important than the election. Uh, the election contributes to it. Too much money chasing too few votes. You know, there was $17 billion spent on this election. So... Maybe that goes away and CPI comes down a little bit. If we get the kind of numbers that you saw on the screen, that should be a little bit of good news. This is a long slog, but it does show inflation going in the right direction. The key to watch tomorrow, prices for services. Supply chains seem to be normalizing quickly now. Goods price increases have been coming down. That should continue. Watch for drops in apparel as retailers clear inventory used cars wholesale prices we've talked about this a lot have been down quite a lot and possibly even new cars as inventories increase on the services side obviously rent and home prices are still expected to come in hot even though private measures of those prices have dropped it takes a long time to show up in the cpi bloomberg economics thinks we'll see them crest now and really start to decline in quarter one but health insurance costs are forecast to drop a lot as the pandemic fades. Airline fares, other travel expenses may as well. We know gasoline and food are higher, and that is an ongoing problem because it's what people see every day. But uh, the Fed can't do anything about that. So they're going to be looking at the core. You know, inflation is a lagging indicator. The Fed's never tamed inflation without rates going above the rate of inflation. Forecasts are the Fed will hit 5% in early 2023. Core inflation should fall. So that may happen at the end of the quarter. John, as the old Fed proverb says, the journey of 1,000 miles to 2% target begins with a couple of decimal places. Is that right? Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Out of New York, as always, the brilliant Michael McKee. Back with us, Tony Rodriguez. 
Zach Griffiths for some final thoughts. Tony, I'm not going to ask you your Fed guess. I'm not going to ask you where you think Fed funds peaks. I want to ask you this. We've had 400 basis points of tightening in about eight months, and I don't think we've even started to see the economic consequences of that. Tony, what does that look like in the economy, and what's that going to look like potentially in financial markets? Jonathan, you make a great point. We're really only seeing the beginning of the effects. So obviously the housing market, we're seeing that slow down and there's going to be further ripple effects of that slowdown in housing. We think that we're going to see the greatest impact, I would say, second and third quarter of next year. That's when we think you'll begin to see that data that supports a mild recession in the U.S. There's plenty of reasons why we think we will avoid a deep recession, given the strength of the consumer going into this, the strength of corporate balance sheets going into this. But nonetheless, we are going to have economic weakness, and that's what the response is going to be driven by with respect to financial markets. So right now, we think you'll see a reduction in 2023 earnings as we move later through the year. That will drive, we think, possibly lower equity prices. And when you talk about fixed income, we do think that you'll see some wider spreads. Right now, uh, with the recent rally, we're really pricing in, we think, too much good news, expectations for, for example, default rates being lower than what we expect them to be. So we don't think there'll be a massive washout in risk markets, but we do think you'll see better entry points as some of that economic weakness begins to look a little more clear to investors. Zach, final word. So we take the other side of that and think that while economic growth will slow to below potential, we think we avoid a recession and have more of a bumpy landing than a hard landing. And spreads can tighten from here at least a little bit. We've had a, a fairly big move, especially on the high yield side recently. So perhaps a good portion of that move is done. But again, corporate balance sheets are strong. You don't have a maturity wall in the high yield universe coming until 2025. So we think there are some tailwinds there. And when you look at all in yields around 6% for IG and 9 to 10% for high yield, we think that's attractive. And as people start to look to 2023, they have to look at that and say, this, this looks pretty solid. Even if we do have a mild recession scenario, when you think about where yields are on, from an all in perspective historically. Isaac. Great to catch up, buddy. As always, Zach Griffiths there alongside Tony Rodriguez. Counting you down to the opening bow, seven minutes away. Equity's down a half of 1%. Coming up, we'll get you some morning calls. And later, election uncertainty could fuel a volatility repricing. That's the view from RBC's Amy Wu Silverman. She'll join us around the opening bow in just a moment. Let's get you to the opening bell. Equity futures shaping up as follows this Wednesday morning. Good morning from Washington, D.C., looking up to New York City on Wall Street. Equity futures down six tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, down seven tenths of one percent. Three day winning streak Friday, Monday, Tuesday into Wednesday. There's your opening bell. Can we try and make it four? Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Going into CPI tomorrow, we look a little something like this in a bond market. Yields higher by four basis points on a 10-year, 416 on a 10-year yield. A bit of dollar strength out there. Euro weakness, euro dollar hugging, parity tight, trying to hold on. 10024, euro dollar negative a half of 1%. And crude from the 90s back to the 80s, 87.70 on WTI. We're down about 1.36%. Seconds into this, slightly softer in the equity market. Control of Congress here in Washington still up for grabs. Investors holding out hope for one outcome. Having a little bit of divided government in, in the U.S. is a positive for markets. The market wants to have essentially policy gridlock. We like gridlock because it gives us certainty. Historically, people viewed that as a positive. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be disruptions. The market doesn't want any more fiscal spending. We've already had a, a you know gridlock for, for all practical purposes. We don't think that there'll be durable implications from uh, the midterm elections. It's going to help put some upward boost on the equity market. Equities have actually taken quite a bit of relief already. Taylor Riggs joins us now for more. Hey, Taylor. 
John, that soundbite really wraps it up nicely. When you think about, according to our MLive survey polls, what markets are really looking for, and it really is sort of that gridlock that is nice for equity markets, knowing that you can't rush in sort of an era of fiscal policy or a bunch of new regulation. Take a look at this. Professional investors on a desired election result, 48% like a total House and Senate um, all Republican. Split Congress is next, and then Democratic, of course, on both the House and the Senate is just the lowest at 18 percent. Again, given that you don't have the checks and balances with a Democratic president underway. The market reaction would also prove a similar story. This is looking at S&P 500 performance uh, annually after some of these midterms. And as you see, it's sort of either all Republican or a split Congress. And that's really where markets thrive under some of these scenarios. I think what's interesting, we've been talking a lot about the markets. We've been talking a lot about the economics. Take a look at where we are with consumer confidence as well. This is Democratic minus Republican consumer confidence. Basically, when your party is in power, you feel more confident. That's really what you're starting to see here. Net uh, blue, if you will, given uh, sort of that has been the party in power so far. John. Hey, Taylor, wonderful work as always. Looking forward to the coverage at the close with Romain Bostic a little bit later on this afternoon. Amy Wu Silverman of RBC expecting drawn out election results to, quote, cause a repricing around volatility due to extended uncertainty. Joining us now is Amy Wu Silverman of RBC Capital Markets. Amy, let's start there. It's a moving target. So give us your thoughts so far. So look, you know, volatility markets right now are wait and see, certainly because of CPI tomorrow, Fed speak, but we still don't really know what's happening with midterms yet. And, you know, if we do see some of the runoffs that have been mentioned in the news, we, we could not see until December. And, you know, just as your soundbite said earlier, the markets really like uh, to lack certainty. And so to, to have certainty. So if we lack certainty, uh, you know, I think that's what keeps volatility firm, John. And can we talk about the tails? And the one tail that I don't think has really had much discussion, much attention paid to it is the potential for a blue sweep. Amy, it's still out there on the margin. What would that look like in this market? Yeah, definitely. You know, look, I, I think just given how the results are standing right now in the House, I think that's, you know, getting slimmer and slimmer. But the fact that we've had Democrats, I think, do better than expected or Republicans do worse than expected, however you want to say it, um, you know, that was not really being priced by the market. So I think just the extension of how long this could take uh, could keep things firm. The second thing I would say is, you know, we're looking at what the outcomes are for sectors. One we focused on is industrials. And look, if we get kind of more Democrats faring better, there's downside there that we've discussed about from a sector level. And you're really getting payouts priced there right now in options. That's industrials. Let's talk about energy. One thing you said going into this is you like energy upside if Republicans fare better. Can I just challenge the premise of that? Energy's done wonderful with a Washington, D.C. dominated by Democrats. Why would Republicans help the cause? Yeah, you know, I would say, first, this is on kind of a longer-term basis, just regulatory-wise, what implications we see. This was from a survey of all RBC analysts. Uh, and then the second thing I would say is it's also what leverage is being priced into the upside tails of options. So if we get Republicans faring better, what's interesting is when you look at the relative volatility, John, of those 110% calls about one month out, they're pricing quite attractively. And so if you kind of get incremental upside to them, you're getting more leverage on the upside of those calls, specifically in XOP and XLE. Amy, there was one call in here that takes my interest, and that could be interesting around the G20 as well. You said this, I'm watching closely another tale, China's rhetoric around Taiwan and recent positive rhetoric around Ukraine and Russia. A lot of people might argue this morning that the President of the United States goes to the G20 a different man after the results overnight. Amy, what do you think that might mean for the conversation around China? Yeah, it, it's really interesting because, you know, I think certainly uh, Bi Biden has a boost going into the G20 right now, given where the results are, although we don't know kind of the final results. And I think what has been interesting is when, when we talk to options investors and we talk about tails, so, you know, very low probability events, but events that have really meaningful impacts, they all say the fact that we could get a Taiwan situation as early as 2023, as that not being priced in the markets, but, you know, essentially one of the most meaningful geopolitical events for downside that we could see 
and vice versa, the fact that we could get a resolution for Russia and Ukraine quicker than expected. These are not at all being priced into the markets right now. In fact, if you actually look at FXI, which is the China proxy, you're seeing the opposite, a lot of upside being played. So if that reverses quickly, again, those tails are not being priced in and are paying out extremely high. So given where we stand right now, what's the trade you'd recommend? I think given where we're seeing the data right now, the downside on XLI, we've been talking about that through put spreads. So essentially owning an at the money put and selling an out of the money put, that looks very interesting right now, given how Democrats are doing. And then frankly, on a technical level, just given where we see that outperformance and potentially a reversion as we get into year end. Amy, thank you. And can I just say you've been brilliant on this high volatility regime over the last year. Just fantastic. Amy Wu Silverman there of RBC. We're about seven minutes into this. We're down about eight tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down one full percentage point. AMH, you're going to Bali. You'll be at the G20. Let's talk about it. Does the president go to the G20 a different man? He goes with a little bit more pep in his step. This team is going to have some oomph because, yes, the calculus, we are still waiting for, the votes are still coming in, but it is not the red wave that many were predicted. So for him to sit down with Xi Jinping, which we were waiting for, but that's highly anticipated, this president is going to have more of a backing from the United States. It also sends a really big message to President Putin in Russia because it's the Biden administration who's been working in this multilateral approach with European partners to really put pressure on Putin in Moscow when it comes to sanctions, when it comes to aid to Ukraine. So for the Biden administration on the international stage, this is a big win. I don't know what the bilats look like next week, but let's pick out two possible ones. Let's say these are on the table, and you can be a fly on the wall of one. <laughs> the President of the United States and the President of China, or the President of the United States and Chancellor Schultz. Which one would it be? That's a tough one, but I'm going to go with China. Um, kind of what Amy was just outlining there. We want to know in terms of what the discussions are now regarding Taiwan. What are the discussions of China, rega China regarding opening up their COVID zero policy? How much is China going to play ball with the United States on things like climate, which we are reporting that there may be some discussions right now in Egypt at Sharm el-Sheikh when it comes to climate and the fact that China is very upset with the United States with these broad sweeping curbs on advanced technology and semiconductors. But I like how you mentioned Germany, because recently Olaf Scholz made a visit flanked by the biggest corporations of Germany to China. And this was kind of a slap in the face for the United States, the timing of it. Scholz goes to China and President Xi set to go to Riyadh. Now, square that circle for me, because this is really, <laughs> really complex stuff now. The division between Riyadh and D.C. is as wide as it has been for many, many years. But we've seen these divisions. And I think what you're hearing right now from, the, from U.S. officials and from Saudi officials is they are starting to quell. What the U.S. has not been able to square is the fact that they said this trip in July was not about oil. A few months later, the Saudis came out and made an oil decision based on how they viewed the market and also for their own national interest in their economy. And immediately the U.S. said, we're going to review our relationship with the Saudis. So was it about oil or was it not about oil? G20 coming up next week. Anne-Marie's going to be there. You're going to stick around? Yeah, and if I can make one more point. Of course Mohammed, you can. Mohammed bin Salman is becoming ever so more important in this world right now because of the fact that we are going into December 5th, and we don't know yet what's going to happen with those Russian barrels if there's no oil price caps. Do they get shut in? And if China opens up, you're looking at a big spike in crude. And this commodity market has been a big factor in the elections we've been talking about over the last couple of months. AMH, thank you. Equities right now, negative nine-tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down one full percentage point. Abby's got some sector price action for you. Morning, Abby. Hey, John. Well, we actually have some movers here on the first down day in four days for the S&P 500. Let's start out with two of the big names. And we actually have one winner, not many of those out there today, with the decline. And of course, I'm talking about Meta, oddly up 6.4%, uh, or maybe not so oddly, because investors are are happy about the fact that the company is taking uh, measures to cut costs by uh, laying off 11,000 workers. CEO Mark Zuckerberg saying, I got this wrong. Disney really got it wrong, down 10.7 percent, the worst day since March of 2020. They put up what one analyst is calling an objectively bad uh, quarter. They missed. The company is also cutting costs to cope. As for big tech overall, we, of course, have yields higher. That is pressing big tech down, including Apple and Microsoft. Now, Tesla has flipped higher. Earlier, it was lower, of course, on the news uh, around Elon Musk selling another $4 billion uh, worth of his stake after closing the Twitter purchase. So let's watch for volatility there. Speaking of volatility, Lucid down on a horrible quarter. 
out cancellations outpacing new orders by 1600 vehicles. And then finally, to round it out, we of course have the crypto space under tremendous pressure. Bitcoin down 6.4%, other names involved also down sharply. And of course, uh, Mike Novogratz's Galaxy Digital has been exploring laying off as much as 20% of its staff. A key executive did leave. So lots of bad news, volatility. Let's see what ha happens into the close, John. Abby, thank you. We'll catch up with you a little bit later, of course. Meta, I'm pleased Abby talked about it briefly, up by 6.5%. We keep discussing it. The cuts in big tech. We're taking back where some of the excess was. We're taking it back. The question I've got, and I ask it repeatedly, are we taking back some of the excess of the last two years or the last decade? We'll have that conversation through next week as well. Meta, Facebook, up by 6.7%. Coming up on this program, markets buckling up for a potential debt ceiling showdown. They're going to shut down the government by not providing the votes to pay our federal debt to other countries in the world. This is irresponsible. Nothing, nothing, nothing would create more chaos and do more damage to the American economy than playing around with whether we pay our national bills. That conversation, up next. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Andy Blocker and Vesco Global Head of Public Policy. That conversation, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. The uncertainty surrounding the raising of the debt ceiling for both businesses and consumers has been unsettling. We have a problem. Our economy is staggering back into a situation of, of stagnation. The debt ceiling issue will get resolved. In the case of the debt limit, we need to act quickly. This is a credit card bill that we owe. Expect to continue those talks on achieving a bipartisan solution. Nothing would create more chaos and do more damage to the American economy than playing around with whether we pay our national bills. How many times have we done that? The potential return of a divided government reviving fears of a stalemate down in D.C. Investors bracing for a showdown over the debt ceiling with election results still unclear and the Treasury set to hit its limit in the next year. Bloomberg's Michael McKee joins us now for more. Hey, Mike. Morning, John. Well, you guys have been talking about what's going to happen with the next Congress, but the current Congress hasn't ended yet, and they've got a lot to do between now and the end of the year. A lot of financial issues, not just the debt ceiling. Here's what's on the plate that will matter to Wall Street. Uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, it's passed every year for 60 years. Members like their defense money spending, that's going to pass. American Rescue Plan programs, including aid for children's food, uh, the odds are unclear there. They expire at the end of the year. Not sure if that will pass. Government funding, uh, the government runs out of money on December 16th. The odds are now that it will uh, pass, it will be extended, some sort of compromise. Debt ceiling, that's the one. Uh, now, the question here is, will Mitch McConnell let it go forward? Democrats would like to extend it in the lame duck session, so it's not an issue la next year. Uh, McConnell let it go forward last time, and unless Democrats have, uh, Republicans have a clear control of Congress, there may not be a lot of pressure on him to hold it up and to let the debt ceiling come into uh, political con uh, concern. So that may pass. Tax extenders need to, to go uh, away. Government shutdowns don't get noticed very much. They don't show much in terms of the uh, in terms of the overall economy. So that is probably less of an issue. As I said, uh, we'll get some sort of compromise. It's next year you want to worry about. The Inflation Reduction Act, this was going to be Obamacare for the Republicans. They wanted to gut it. Not going to happen, probably. Uh, Ukraine aid, safe for now, probably. Same with student debt forgiveness. Entitlement program reforms, uh, always waiting to see if anything will happen on that. Big one for next year, though, the Trump tax cuts. They expire in 2025. Do they get extended or do your taxes go up? Mike McKee, I can't believe we're doing the debt ceiling debate all over again, but we are. Shanali Vasek, I wondered whether the South Side on Wall Street would just repurpose the notes they wrote a long time ago or whether it's truly different this time. 
uh, it is different this time, and part of it was because of what Michael McHugh was just saying there, just how close you're getting to that debt ceiling already that is putting pressure on this debate, not into next year, but right now, when you think about the lame duck session and Mitch McConnell. You know, I spoke to Charles Myers over at Signum Global, and one thing he says is that if we don't avoid this as early as the end of the year, then it's going to be very difficult anyway to try to get that done for Mitch McConnell between the Freedom Caucus, former President Trump himself, and Trump supported candidates who are going to push back. Now, I want to show you this graph here. This is between May and September of 2011, because there are a number of strategists pointing out this scenario here as the worst case scenario. 2011, you saw a 17, 18 percent drawdown in the S&P at that time. And that is one of the worst case scenarios. And the stock market that we've seen, that was the time the S&P had downgraded the United States. At that time, John, you did not see the crossover into Treasury markets, into the dollar. But this time around, there are more vulnerabilities when you look at the Treasury market into the face of quantitative tightening and uh, how much government debt is owned by sovereigns, as well as the dollar given the highs we've been riding. So there are more concerns today than there were in 2017 cross asset. Again, that is that debt limit, you know, just where we are in government debt past 31 trillion, really uh, creeping up to that limit here. So again, the conversation is happening now. You know, what does this mean for the market at the end of the day? Myers had said the overhang will last until this gets resolved. People are a little concerned at the margins of putting extra money to work with this overhang here. But of course, you have that bright side, that Morgan Stanley bright side, that a little less fiscal, stim uh, fiscal spending could be better for the market overall if you hang through. Shanali, thank you. Over in New York City, back here in DC, Amory standing by. AMH, we're doing it all over again, it seems. At least that's what a lot of people are forecasting. For the debt ceiling. Yep. It's a perennial question. It happens all the time in Washington, but at the end of the day, they do end up raising it. They don't want to put the fiscal health of the United States at risk. But Goldman Sachs note is interesting. What they're forecasting potentially, and remember, the votes are still coming in. We do not know the composition of the House and the Senate. But if it does look like the Republicans have the House and the Democrats keep the Senate, potentially it mirrors 2011, 2013, and it could disrupt financial markets because it could be a tough fight. But in the end, they're going to raise it. They're going to raise it. Is it different this time? We're going to keep asking that question for the next several months. AMH, stand by. I get a final thought from you when we close out the program, when we close out the hour. Right now, equities down eight tenths of one percent with the price action. Back with us, here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, yeah, the declines are sticking around right now on lower than uh, average volume, but we do have most sectors down, not surprisingly, with that solid decline for the S&P 500, led by energy and technology. We also have the financials lower. Energy down about 2.4 percent. This, of course, as oil is lower. Uh, technology, we were looking at some of those big laggards earlier. You've been saying it all year. Yields up, stocks down. That's especially true for technology. Consumer discretionary, another one of those mega cap tech sectors. It is also lower to the upside ever so slightly. Those defensive sectors, or at least one defensive sector, healthcare and then real estate. As for some of the individual movers beneath the surface, uh, one part of the technology weakness really has to do with the chips and the socks. Take a look at the socks down 1.9% after gaining nearly 10% in three days. Those declines uh, coming back in, those gains uh, being uh, moderated. NVIDIA down sharply, and China Tech down once again, John. Baidu down 6.3%, JD.com down 5.6%. 5 5 Volatility, the name of this year, the name of the game this year, and that certainly seems to be the case today. Abby, thank you. Wonderful to have you back with us. And the equity market then down eight tenths of 1%. Coming up, the trading diary and a final word from AMH right here in Washington, D.C. And for those of you who are terminal subscribers on the Bloomberg, take a look at this. Former State Secretary John Kerry sitting down with Bloomberg's John Micklethwaite. You can catch that on the Bloomberg terminal at Live Go. From Washington, this is Bloomberg. We proved that in Glasgow where 65% of global GDP of the largest economies in the world the 20 largest countries, 20 biggest economies. Equities down about three quarters of 1%. Let's get you straight to the trading diary. More Fed speak on the agenda. Barkin, Kashkari on deck, Waller, Harker, Logan, Daly, Mester, George, all speaking on Thursday. Another round of jobless claims. And they'll be speaking after CPI in America, the main event tomorrow morning. Finally, you, Mitch, on Friday to round out the week and get you to the weekend. 
Let's round out the week here in Washington, D.C. Anne-Marie, first of all, fantastic coverage of the last couple of days from you and the team, and thank you for having us. Can I get a final word, a final thought from you, your big takeaway from overnight and this morning? Lindsey Graham saying it was not the red wave at all. That's for darn sure. The biggest takeaway, a win for Biden. We have not seen a president not lose this bad in midterm elections since the September 11th terrorist attacks and it was George W. Bush. The second, of course, is that the biggest winner is Ron DeSantis. A huge margin he won by, and already the chants are talking about his run for 2024. And you can tell the former president is incredibly worried. First off, not all of his candidates are doing well. We're still waiting for those votes to come in, but already the likes of Mehmet Oz, his backing for Michigan and Gummerger, they did not make it through. And he's saying that if DeSantis runs, he has unflattering material he's going to be leaking. Setting the stage for 2024. Anne-Marie, great to be with you. From Washington, D.C., thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.